This week we're in Kazakhstan. The view from the top. A vast country in the middle of Central Asia. Full of stunning landscapes and nomadic traditions. You can feel the fish tugging on the net. Nature and the great outdoors have always been central to the Kazakh people's way of life. Birds chirping, fish jumping, sun setting. I get it. And I'm here to explore how they're now combining both ancient and modern ways to stay in touch with their wild side. It feels good to make the sound, I don't know what to say. I've arrived in Kazakhstan's biggest city of Almaty. Once, back when the country was still part of the USSR, and long before that, it was the capital city. Now, things have changed here. Back in 1991, it was the last Soviet Republic to declare independence, 10 days before the collapse of the Union. Since then, it's been under the rule of President Nazarbayev, who moved the capital north to the purpose-built city of Astana. One thing is clear, however, this country has undergone a tumultuous period. But through it all, nature has continued to play a vital role for the once nomadic people here and for travelers who visit. You start to get a sense of that at the Green Bazaar. There's been a market here since before Soviet times. This is fermented horse milk which has been around since the nomadic times, and they say it is a cure for tuberculosis. Oh, it's a strong taste. The aftertaste is almost like you're smoking a cigar. I don't know why, but it's exactly what it tastes like. Very sharp, though, very intense taste. <sighs> Ramit. <sighs> Some Russian influences have remained but some of the old Kazakh traditions that have been suppressed under the Soviets are once again bubbling to the surface. Like faith in Tengriism, calling on nature through shamans, known as Baxis. Armand, my friend. I wanted to find a Baxi, so I'm meeting up with someone who says he can get me an introduction. Can you tell me a bit about what exactly a Baxi is? Baxi are spiritual servants uh, who are created by nature to help people. These days, in modern culture, do people still go see a Baxi? Yes, of course, it's part of our life. If uh, official medicine, European medicine, don't help, uh, people go to Baxi. Well, Armand, I can't say I know what to expect, but I feel ready. Armin takes me to a far corner of the city and an old, unmarked apartment block. Let's go. So we're on our way up to the Baxi's apartment. Should be waiting for us outside the door. Not entirely what I expected. Here we are. Come in. Welcome. We've just arrived here in the Baxi's apartment and there we're arrived in the middle of some kind of ceremony. There are two ladies who are getting their souls cleaned. I guess it's hard to know what's going on. This is extremely intense. Can you explain to me a bit about what's happening right now? Uh, it's a ritual of cleaning by fire. 
you know, bad spirit. Yeah. yeah ask them to leave. Like an exorcism. Yes, yes. Each Baxi is different, and this one incorporates elements of Islam, Kazakhstan's most followed religion. There is a power in this room I can't describe right now. I have never experienced anything like this. Через определенные э, такие вот э, обряды. После этого, наоборот, легкость, хорошо, улыбка, счастье и радость внутри, она идет на место. So, now it's my turn. Having witnessed the devotion Vera had to the process, I feel it wouldn't be right to go through it all without the same belief. So, we agree on just a blessing for my journey. But then, unexpectedly, I seem to be getting the full treatment. It feels, it feels good to make the sound. I don't know what to say. He's coaxing and experienced lung. It's very powerful. As the process continues, the Baxi calls on the totem animals, as they did many years ago here. I may not believe in everything that's happening here, but I do like to open myself to the experience as a traveler. All I can say is I know I feel something. Although many Muslims here frown on these ancient ceremonies, for some Kazakhs, they are a direct link to their nomadic past. It's the world's ninth largest country, but Kazakhstan is also one of the most sparsely populated. Its people were traditionally nomadic, with their lives tied to their environment. Today, travelers come to explore its relatively untouched landscapes. I want to find out more of the Kazakhstani people's relationship with nature today. So I'm heading east to the Aral Sea, the world's fourth largest lake, or at least that's what it was. Welcome to the dusty streets of Jalanash. If you can believe it, this used to be a bustling fishing village. But if you come over here and you look down at the ground, you can see what used to be the bottom of the Aral Sea. There's not much fishing going on now. It's been called one of the world's biggest environmental disasters. The sea which stretches the border between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan was once about the size of Ireland. Back in the 1960s, the immense stretch of water began to dry up. Around 90% of it was wiped off the map, and with it, the livelihoods of many people who lived on the sea's produce. I'd heard that here in Kazakhstan, the sea was actually coming back, and it was bringing travelers too. So off I go, in search of the Aral Sea, across miles of the old seabed. I've arranged to meet a guide in this region. He wanted me to see the full extent of what the sea, which was actually a large lake, once was, thousands of years before it dried up in the 20th century. The view from the top. Yeah, this line 
принадлежало от бывшего моря, а вот это уже дно от древнего моря. What caused it to recede so far? Две реки, которые вливали в Арайское море, одну реку, одну реку Амударю закрыли, а вторую реку они э, перенаправили на другое русло, чтобы для ирригации э, правильно, да? The flow of water was diverted to feed the Soviet cotton industry. Uzbekistan still remains one of the world's top producers of cotton. But while the Uzbek side of the sea still remains mostly lost, recent interventions have meant the North Aral Sea in Kazakhstan is returning. Ну, во-первых, благодаря вот правительству и Всемирному банку в 2005 году построена дамба, Кокарайская дамба. Об этом знают весь мир, думаю, почти. И вот в связи с этим море как бы все ближе и ближе становится. Approaching the shore, one of the biggest draws for travelers has been the eerie sight of shipwrecks scattered across the old seabed. Spider webs everywhere. And here we are. The Aral Sea, at one time it was the fourth largest inland lake in the world, and soon it will reclaim that title. Birds chirping, fish jumping, sun setting. I get it. I get it now. It's a beautiful place. Good morning. This is where we spent the night last night. It might look like we're in the desert, but it's actually it's very cold this morning. The bedding was just a simple roll-out pillow mat on the ground with some blankets. But this is a fisherman's house, and we're up so early because they're going to take us this morning to catch some fish. They are quite chipper. Myself, I'm working on it. <laughs> but it should be a good day. <laughs> My hosts tell me that I'm not the first traveler to stay with them following the sea's return. Though, not all of them choose the early morning fishing run. The sun has not yet crested over the horizon of the Kazakh steppe. Today we are fishing and on the fishing team we have one sleepy, inexperienced travel show presenter. We have Yudige, oh, who you know already. We have Omir Sivik, our fisherman and his father in the back. <laughs> These are our boats. Out there, there's a lot of fish and the plan is today to catch them and bring them back to shore. Maybe 100 meters offshore, we've encountered the first net. So from what I understand, the net was put out last night right before sunset. And it stays out until sunrise, and they come and they pull it back in, and every day is quite a surprise. But it seems that over the years, there's been more and more in the nets almost every single day. Okay, so it's my turn to give this a shot, pulling in the net. It's, it's not too hard, actually. It's, it's interesting because it's almost like when you're fishing with a reel, you can feel the fish tugging on the net. You must love it out here. Yeah, balks We've been <laughs> pulling the net for about 30 minutes now. The basket's almost full, so I think we're probably getting near to the end. 
we've caught a lot of fish, and besides the amount, they're, they're big fish. For myself being a traveler, connecting with people is always very special, and here you can tell that there's a lot of joy in the job this morning. It's not my normal life being out here covered in fish scales in the boat, but for them, <laughs> it is, and you can tell that they, they absolutely love it, especially when they can bring in a haul like this. I wanted to see how Kazakhstan's relationship with nature is changing, so I'm meeting up with a mountain guide back in Almaty. She's agreed to take me out to some of the places she likes to explore. We begin at the location of one of the country's most impressive historical sites. Oh, wow, they look almost like paintings. Yeah, they are petroglyphs. And these, these cliffs are covered with petroglyphs, right? This isn't the only site, yeah, there's many sites. Yeah, exactly. It's many sites. It's about 5,000 carvings here. Wow. It was discovered in 1957 by archaeologist Maximova, and um, it's more than 5,000 uh, carvings on the rocks in, in this area. And this is the central part, which is very significant and very important at that date because people were speaking from here and it was a, served as a pantheon. So you can clearly hear what they were talking about, like down in a valley where the people and crowds were standing and listening. So here we see the 12 dancing uh, men, which is uh, doing the ritual dance. And here it's a um, uh, woman which is uh, giving a birth to a child. Yeah, this one. As you walk around the site, it's amazing how many carvings you see here. This here is the club. Yeah. Carla tells me it's thought they believed the more animals they carved in the rocks, the more animals they would successfully hunt. It adds so much to the experience here today, being able to come just in touching distance of things that are so old. I'm used to multiple layers of security, men standing there making sure you don't breathe on art like this. But being able to see every little chip out of this stone really makes it special. But what Carla really wanted to show me was how some people are mixing old Kazakhstan with the new. Sandboarding on Kazakhstan's most famous singing sand dune. Famous because under the right conditions, the dune makes a humming sound, almost like an organ. Wow. It's huge. Well, you can see the little dust devils twisting up the sides. It almost looks alive. The skin of the dune sweeping back and forth like a snake. And I heard that it almost is. It actually moves. In the past 150 years, it's moved three meters. Slowly, but it is moving. It really is incredible. <laughs> I don't know how <laughs> we're going to snowboard down it. <laughs> Along for the ride was Carla's friend and Olympic Kazakhstan snowboard trainer, Liena. The dune stretches for three kilometers and reaches a height of 150 meters. And let me tell you, it might look placid from a distance, but it is an entirely other story once you're up there. It's a little bit windy today, but we're on the singing sands, and I guess that's always how it is here. For myself, I've gone snowboarding before. What are some differences with sandboarding? Здесь не нужно давить на доску, здесь нужно позволить ей ехать. И она поедет очень медленно, медленнее, чем на снегу. Нужно отклониться немножко назад и дать ей позволить проехать. Не делать резких движений. Никаких. Okay. Lean back, yeah? Да, немножко назад. That being said, it was comforting knowing that I'll be going slower than on snow. And also, the cool thing about a sand dune is there's no trees. So, I mean, I guess it's safer, right? No doubt though, this is definitely the definition of an extreme sport. And here I am strapped in. Okay, you ready? I, I think I'm ready.
know, I, I promise you, that you get sand in a lot of places you do not want sand. One of those places is your mouth. I've got, I've got a bit of a crunch in, in my teeth right now. But woo, it is a rush. Carla's about to come down. She's standing up. She looks excited, but a little bit nervous. You got it, Carla! Yeah! But before long, we're starting to get the hang of it. work. What's incredible though is when you come down as the sand starts to avalanche you can feel it shaking and reverberating underneath the board. It's very cool. It sings as you come down. And we got our final round from the very very top. If, if, I, can, if I can make it. Let's stay here and take a break for a sec. And with that, my trip to Kazakhstan is at an end. And what a ride it was. <laughs>